hello and welcome to another Quarren stream. I am, of course, your host, Joe Magician, and today we'll be talking about the mysterious and powerful Quarren of Winter. Oh, maybe powerful, maybe mysterious. Well, definitely mysterious, maybe powerful. We're not exactly sure about that one. Um, <laughs> after my stream uh, with History of Westeros, I believe that was last week on Sunday, we talked about Victorian Winds of Winter chapter. If you haven't checked it out, I'm going to put links in the description. Um, that was an awesome time hanging out with Aziz and Ashea. And we talked about Victorian and his deep, beautiful love of Dragonbinder, which is definitely not creepy and in no way like Gollum as he rubs his blood over the horn. Normal stuff. Who doesn't do that to a favorite horn? That's what I'm saying. Uh, <laughs> but I decided to keep the fun going, and we're going to talk about the other famous horn in A Song of Ice and Fire. The ice to the fire of Dragonbinder, the old horn of winter, or the horn of Jorman. If you're, if you're a primarily show watcher, this may confuse you, because this basically did not exist in the, in the show. Um, so this is mostly a book-only thing. This is definitely going to be something for the Winds of Winter, something to look forward to. Uh, something that may have a dramatic impact on the story. Um, I see that before we went live, got a whole bunch of super chats here. Uh, so we'll just, uh, I was going to add these to my doc. Hang on a second. And I'll get to them later in the stream. I just want to say thank you. Uh, five, so $15 total from Eric Ferg. Um, add those to your other questions. The question asker himself, the guy <laughs> that asks everything. I don't know what I would do without him. But thank you so much for the super chats. Very generous, Eric. And then let's see here. 10 pounds from Ravona Zamfir. Thank you again, Ravona. Thank you very, very much. $10 from Lemmy B. Hey, thank you, Lemmy. Very generous. Appreciate it. And then $50 from Maura Lee. Maura, how? How do, how do you always do this? I appreciate it very much. Very, very generous of you. Uh, let me add that to the list. Uh, actually, that will probably go right near the end of the stream, looking by the content. And I believe I have some PayPal donations to go through real fast. Um, let's see here. Uh, $10 from Amy Blackfire in the chat. She said, uh, great topic. I'm excited for this one. Can I get a shout out for Aaron M? Things have been stressful for me and she has been the best friend you can ask for. Yes. All the shout outs to Aaron M. Um, mistress of the hammers. Not sure where she is today. Um, people come and go. That's sort of how it goes, but yes, thank you, Aaron, for all you do. And especially for the help you've been giving Amy. Thank you, Amy, for the, so for the super chat, um, five dollars from Danny McKay. Happy Saturday. He signed right back at you, buddy. Uh, let's see here. Ten dollars from uh, June S. No message, but again, thank you very much, June. Appreciate it. And then another Mora. <laughs> Is this another fifty dollars? <laughs> Is this today? Uh, yeah, it is. This is this is another one. Uh, let me see if I can pull up the message. I don't think this one has a question on it. Um, thank, thank you, Mora. Just on fire today with the donations. And pretty much all the time, from what I understand. Log into my PayPal. Fast. Nobody could see this, right? Just typing my excessively long password. Yeah, making it rain. Always making it rain. <laughs> uh, let me check this out. If I don't catch it in time, basically on the app, it cuts off the message, so I can't read it. So I have to try and get it right away and hit the right button. And, it, and if it gets pushed off, then I can't see it. Uh, to Joe Magician, just a gift of love and appreciation for all the excellent content, merch, and extras you provide us on Patreon. 
You are very loved. Thank you. Hugs from Mora. Oh, that's very sweet, Mora. I really, really appreciate it. Uh, so the PayPal donation is on the top of the thing. I thought I'd put it down in the description last week, but I guess I didn't. So it's just pinned there if you want if you want it. Also the Patreon donations. I mean the Patreon uh signups. Actually, I'll do that stuff later. So let's go ahead and uh let's go into the stream itself. Now there's one quote that I find really, really interesting. Uh there's a lot of quotes about uh, the Horn of Winter. Jorman and all these other kind of things. It's a major plot point throughout a Clash of Kings and a Storm of Swords. But there's one person who really, really, really doesn't like the Horn of Winter and thinks it is the worst thing in the world. And that is, of course, Melisandre of Ashai. This is her quote. Um, before she burns what she thinks is the Horn of Winter, she says, the Horn of Jorman? No, call it the Horn of Darkness. If the wall falls, night falls as well, the long night that never ends, it must not happen, will not happen. So George, again, re-emphasizing the stakes from the Horn of Winter that it will supposedly destroy the wall itself. Something she has been made aware of, or she may have been picked up from the Wildlings, it's not quite clear. It'd be surprising if Melisandre of Ashai knew of the Horn of Winter before coming to the wall. I think it's important to go back. Like I said, this is a the Horn of Winter itself is a very important artifact and plot point throughout the first throughout a Clash of Kings and a Storm of Swords all the way into a Dance of Dragons, despite not particularly doing anything, which is not something you'd kind of expect from something that is chased after and is kind of the key of one of the major plot lines in the story. So the Horn of Winter itself is an artifact that has been teased all the way back in a Clash of Kings very, very, very briefly, and then has steadily been increasing in, vil in visibility and importance in the Jon Snow plot line. It has a similar sort of reveal structure to a lot of the seemingly colliding magical base characters and objects like Dragonbinder, Marvin the Mage, and Euron Greyjoy. It's one of those things where George does his threefold reveal, where he he drops the name very early on, just kind of drops it in, and then forgets it. You forget it for a couple books, you come back, and then suddenly this thing is showing up in force in the narrative, and it kind of makes you want to go back and reread the things and see exactly what's going on here. Um... Yes, the horn MacGuffin. <laughs> the horn guffin, that's right, Isabel. <laughs> that's a good way of saying it. Um, the first mention of the Horn of Winter comes from J.R. Mormont, and it's almost offhandedly. It's not really something that's emphasized. It's not something you read this paragraph and you go like, oh, well, the Horn of Winter in Jorman is the most important part of this. <gasps> Pay attention right here. This is the most important paragraph. No, not really. It's... It's just kind of brushed over. So uh, J.R. Mormont and Jon Snow are discussing the new King Beyond the, Raw, the Wall Mance Raider and what exactly he's trying to do with his army because they are very confused. <clears throat> so let's see here. The, uh, the quote goes... Oh, so the um, the intro to this is that J.R. is basically thinking about Mance's plan that he's trying to gather everyone beyond the wall and make one massive assault, destroy the Night's Watch, and get beyond, behind the wall, basically. And John is essentially reciting his history lessons because he was a good boy that got taught by Maester Lewin about northern history and different kings beyond the wall and essentially how they fared, which, spoiler, were not well. They did not, they did not fare well. Wildlings have invaded the realm before. John had heard the tales from Old Nan and Maester Lewin both back at Winterfell. Raymond Redbeard led them south in the time of my grandfather's, in the time of my grandfather's grandfather, and before him there was a king named Bael the Bard. Aye, and long before them came the Horn Lord and the brothers and the brother kings Gendel and Gorn in ancient days Jorman, who blew the horn of winter and woke giants from the earth. Each man of them broke his strength on the wall, always broken by the power of Winterfell on the far side. But the Night's Watch is only a shadow of what we were. 
And who remains to oppose the Wildlings besides us? Yeah. The Lord of Winterfell is dead, and his heir has marched his strength south to fight the Lannisters. The Wildlings may never have such a chance as this. I knew Mance Raider, John. He was an oathbreaker, yes. But he has eyes to see, and no man has ever dared to name him Faint Heart. So the example that we're getting here from the Horn of Winter is just buried in a bunch of northern lore. And it's also important that these are being used by, as examples of failures from Kings Beyond the Wall. These are Kings Beyond the Wall that did not do what they were tending to do. Uh, they are all previous warlords that were broken by the Night's Watch, the Wall, or Winterfell itself. And that includes Jorman. Importantly, that Jorman blew his horn according to the, to the tale, but it still didn't work. He woke the giants from the earth and he still failed to conquer. Okay. That's not a good sign for the Horn of Winter and Jorman King Beyond the Wall. Kind of setting it up as like, um, I mean, it's, it's a cool sounding mythical object, but wasn't enough to defeat them before. So, okay. Neat story. Cool. Cool sounding horn. And that's kind of all we get from it for the rest of the book. It completely disappears off page. The next mention we get from it is in a storm of swords. When Jon Snow meets a literal giant, and he recalls the story of Jorman and his horns waking giants from the earth, and wonders, in a way only Jon can, ah, you silly, silly boy, if that means literally the giant standing in front of him. They're not wearing skins, Jon realized. That's hair. Shaggy pelts covered their bodies, thick below the waist, sparser above. The stink that came off them was choking, but perhaps that was the mammoths. And Jorman blew the horn of winter and woke giants from the earth. He looked for great swords ten feet tall, but saw any clubs. Most were just the limbs of dead trees, some still trailing shattered branches. He had stone balls lashed to the ends to make colossal mauls. The song says the song never says if the horn can put them back to sleep. So again, John's taking the most literal explanation of this story that he may have heard for the first time from J.R. He's like, okay, well, maybe this is literal. Maybe if you blow the horn of winter, like giants wake from the earth. Like they literally like, <laughs> like they, they rise up from the earth, like a golem or something, or you raise them from like some kind of ancient slumber. And then they're your command. That's what John thinks here. And that's almost certainly wrong. And that's sort of the point here. John is using, George is using John's ignorance to explore the obvious question that readers will have about this horn in the future, a thing he's planning to introduce more and more. Does that mean leer, real giants? No, it means something less literal. John Snow does know nothing after all, and George uses that as a way to inform the reader a little bit more about this strange artifact. Um, so the horn remains kind of a neat factoid for John as we're progressing through the Mance Raider plot. However, there's, there's one big mystery that is plaguing the Night's Watch. And that is why exactly has Mance Raider gone to the Frost Fangs? If you don't remember, the Frost Fangs are these massive snow-capped mountains and valleys on the west side of the lands beyond the wall, north of the Shadow Tower and the Bay of Ice. Uh, this is incredibly puzzling to J.R. Mormont in particular because there's no good reason to take a massive army all the way up into the Frostfangs. It doesn't give you a tactical advantage for an attack, really. It's a series of mountains that are so unforgiving and brutal that they're basically used as a stronghold for various tribes hiding in the valleys, including the Thens. It's a defensive position. It's not an offensive one. And that is very troubling to the Night's Watch as they know Mance to be a very intelligent, tactical commander, and yet he's doing something that sounds very stupid. You would never want to take your frost, uh, an army into the Frost Fangs unless you were running from something. Um, I, yeah, it, it doesn't help Mance really gather more troops, resources, or attack the Wall and the Night's Watch. So yeah, why are they there? This question, in fact, leads to the Great Ranging and Jon Snow's uh, mission with Corrin Halfhand where he meets Egret. So all of these things are linked to this one question, why is he in the Frostfangs? 
Uh, the best guesses that we got from the Night's Watch, and we'll see from Corrin Halfhand, is that Mance is doing it to hide his numbers from the Rangers, but even that doesn't really make a lot of sense, because the only way at down from the Frostfangs to attack the Night's Watch is going down by the Milk Water, which is observed by the Fists of the First Men, so Mance isn't really hiding his numbers in any way. As soon as he decides to attack, the Rangers will see them, count, ride back, and let the rest of the Night's Watch know, so the surprise is blown. But then there's another question. There's another uh, possibility that Corrin Halfhand raises. He says, uh, How else? Sorcery. Corrin bit the egg in half. Why else would Mance choose to gather his strength in the Frostfangs, bleak and hard as they are, and a long, weary march from the wall? So Corrin is saying that there must be something like magical, something weird going up in the Frostfangs that they're not re they don't really know about. And that's why Mance is up there, because all the other reasons don't make any sense tactically. So we get a little bit of more investigation from Detective Jay Snow uh, when he meets Tormund Giantsbane. John has continued to sort of think in the back of the head about this whole Horn of Winter thing since he met the Giants. And it comes up again. So here we go. So how'd you come by your other names, John asked. Vance called you the Hornblower, didn't he? Mead King of Ruddy Hall, husband to bear, his father to hosts. It was the horn blowing he particularly wanted to hear about, but he dare not ask it plainly. And Jorman blew the horn of winter and woke giants from the earth. Is that where they had come from, them and their mammoths? No, John, that's not where they came from. <laughs> the best detective. Um, had Mance Raider found the horn of Jorman and given it to Tormund Thunderfist to blow? And this is uh, Tormund's reaction. Are all crows so curious? And that's kind of the end of it. Tormund moves on. But what's going on here is that John has accidentally narrowed in on what Mance has been doing in the Frostfangs. He thinks he's gone to the Frostfangs to get the Horn of Winter to wake the giants, and the gi giants are evidence of it. So John is right. Mance did go to the Frostfangs for it to find the Horn of Winter, but he's got the reasoning entirely wrong. What he doesn't realize, because he's a uh, a Southern boy, is that he doesn't know that the Giants are just around. They're just a part of the Wildling society if you want to find them. You don't have to wake them from the earth with a, with a special horn. You just have to go talk to them, which is what Mance Raider did. So yeah, John Detective... Jon Snow detective. Yeah, CSI Winterfell. Uh, he uh, got it right, got it wrong. Um, correct what he's doing, wrong why he's doing it. Oh, also, I forgot to say, um, as we're starting the stream, we got 140 people watching, 60 likes. You guys slam that like button up to 150. And we have the new show magician a uh, wizard hat that I will I'll put on for the rest of the stream if you guys slam it up to 150 and I got the old uh and I got the germ greek sailor's hat with his turtle on it at 175 200 likes I will uh I'll read something from the upcoming video about lady stoneheart that is basically done except for some video stuff so actually can I play part of it no, probably not. That would give too much away, but I can read part of it. Yes, yeah, slam that MF and like button. I really appreciate you guys. It also helps out with uh, with YouTube and the algorithm and all these other kind of things. Every time you do something on a channel you like, you leave a comment, you leave a like, you answer a poll or something like that. It sends signals to its algorithm to say like, hey, this person liked that stream, maybe other people will like it. And it starts spreading it. So that's how it goes. Slam that MF and like button, really appreciate it. Of course, if you're enjoying the stream, <laughs> please do if you're enjoying the stream. I'm hoping it's not just out of obligation for a hat, but also that you like what we're doing. Yes, the YouTube algorithm is a very hungry beast. It is like a weirwood. Um, oh, so where was I? So we finally get the answer from Egret, and she gives up the whole game to John after they have, quote unquote, fallen in love. I mean, they probably did fall in love, but it's basically um, Egret breaks down and she's 
crying and John's like, what? what's wrong? What are you afraid of? What's going on here? And she says this. Not for fear. She kicks savagely, savagely at the ice beneath her with a heel, chopping out a chunk. I'm crying because we never found the horn of winter. We opened half a hundred graves, and let all those shades loose into the world, and never found the horn of Jorman to bring this cold thing down. Okay, so that Egret tells John the entire plan. Vance Raider has been up in the up in the frost fangs, trying to find graves, particularly graves of giants. And they've been opening them, hoping that for some reason inside one of these uh, one of these graves is the Horn of Jorman or the Horn of Winter, but they have completely and utterly failed in that. As far as Egret knows, they never found the Horn of Winter, and it's part of her frustration with their current campaign. They don't have the super weapon they are hoping to have against the Night's Watch. Uh, one question that comes up to this, obviously, is, so why did Mance think the Horn of Jorman would be in the Frostfangs to begin with? Um, why was he using the all the tribes of the Wildlings as like a mass excavation crew, finding every grave up there and opening them, trying to find this horn? Well, there's a few reasons. Um, if you take the wake giants from the Earth literally, the implication is that there's some connection between the Horn of Winter and giants. So if you know where most of the giants are buried, which is apparently up in the Frostfangs, then perhaps within one of the graves is also the Horn of Winter itself. I mean, it's it's a simple idea, but you don't have a lot to go on. We just have these weird stories. So, okay, I guess that makes sense. Uh, second reason, as a former Night's Watch ranger, that um, Mance would know that the... The Night's Watch and those from the rest of Westeros have not gone far into the Frost Fangs themselves. So if there's anywhere where a magic artifact may be hiding from the prying eyes of the rangers, maybe the Frost Fangs is a good place to start. There's a lot of weird stuff up there. There's a lot of unknowns. So if you'd also heard that there were graves up there, um, important artifacts are often buried in graves. Kind of makes sense. Okay. I, I guess that makes a little bit of sense. But then the third reason and this is uh, something that Corin Halfan was talking about, is that there's kind of a, a dark magic weirdness going on around the Frostfangs. Um, it's said that those scattered villages in the valleys and around the Frostfangs worship dark, cold gods, and that there's all these weird graves kind of gives it uh, basically a spooky vibe. And it's known within the Night's Watch and the Corn Half Hand that there's something magic and weird up there. So if you're looking for like the most magical object the Wildlings have ever had, maybe that's a good place to go looking. If you want to do a, um, <laughs> if you're really into uh, archaeology, I guess. So three good reasons why he's up there. Well, not, I'm not even sure they're good reasons. There's just reasons. I don't. Um, maybe you heard a story from somebody. Maybe one of the tribesmen told him that. Who knows? Um, oh, Mana ASJ. Oh my god, I caught one live. My like finally goes to her hat. Hey, thank you. I'm glad you finally got to uh, got to make a stream. Slam that like button. Uh, DW says no hat today. Well, there will be a hat if we get to 150 likes. We got 90 right now. So 60 to go. 150 people watching. Just, you know, hit that button and we'll put on that awesome, awesome hat. Um, so what happens afterwards is that uh, John eventually escapes and he reports back to the Night's Watch and he talks with Maester Aemon about what he's learned about Mance and the Frostfangs. <clears throat> so this is John talking. He says, It means, Lord, John agreed, Steer is the Magnar of some place called Then in the far north of the Frostfangs. He is a hundred of his own men and a score of raiders who know the gift almost as well as we do. Mance never found the horn, though. That's something. The Horn of Winter, that's what he was digging up for along the milk water. Maester Aemon paused, washcloth in hand. The Horn of Winter is an ancient legend. Does the king beyond the wall truly believe that such a thing exists? They all do, said John. Egret said they opened a hundred graves, graves of kings, heroes, all over the valley of the milk water, but they never... He gets cut off there. And he gets questioned about the, like, a, hey, John, um... 
egret who's this egret person and he has to go ahead and explain the fact that like oh yeah i did break my night's watch vows like a thousand times especially in this cave oh my god this in the cave this one time <laughs> he's just so proud of all his sex way to go john congrats on the sex Um, Alistair, Th Alistair Thorne also expresses doubt that the horn ever exists. Never mind that Mance actually found it. John swallowed his anger. I abandoned no one. I left the fist with Corrin Halfhand to scout the Skirling Pass. I joined the Wildlings under orders. The Halfhand feared that Mance might have found the Horn of Winter. The Horn of Winter? Sir Alistair chuckled. Were you commanded to count their snarks as well, Lord Snow? No, but I counted their giants as best I could. So this is another one of those things where nobody south of the wall believes this horn ever existed. They put it on the uh, the idea of legend along with the others, the children of the forest, um, snarks and grumpkins. Like nobody, nobody, nobody is going to believe John that the horn of winter is real. Um, and there's probably good reason for that in universe. I mean, German, if he ever existed, was alive thousands of years before. And it's not like there's a, a written history or like a museum for magical artifacts where like the wildlings keep it in pristine condition. Nobody even knows where Jorman was buried, if he ever was, if he was buried with the horn or where it may be otherwise. It's just another weird artifact from a legend that maybe lost the time that Mance is taking seriously. Perhaps for good reason, though, because that's one of George's favorite things. He has... Um, basters and, and southerners doubt things only to make them real because of course he does. Yeah, breaking his oath for good reasons. I didn't say they weren't good reasons. I'm just saying he broke those vows over and over and over again with a lot of passion under underneath some very gross sounding furs. So way to go, Jay Snow. Again, congrats on the sex, buddy. You, you did it. Um, however, there is a quite a big plot twist. After John uh, abandons Egret and makes his way back to the Night's Watch, Mance, um, John is sent back to Mance in order to negotiate uh, a peace with him, but also may probably to kill him in cold blood underneath guest right because none of the night's watch higher ups except for basically Eamon thinks that they all think he's a traitor basically so his only chance to live is to kill mance so this is the scene itself it says <clears throat> a war horn a bloody great war horn yes mance said the horn of winter that jorman once blew to wake the giants from the earth the horn was huge, eight feet along the curve and so wide at the mouth, he could have he could have put his arm inside up to the elbow. If this came from an aurochs, it was the biggest that ever lived. At first, he thought the, the bands around it were bronze. When he moved closer, he realized they were gold. Keep that in mind. Old gold, more brown than yellow and graven with runes. He could said you never found the horn. Did you think only crows could lie? I liked you well enough for a bastard, but I never trusted you. A man needs to earn my trust. So Mance here is totally sidestepping Egret's tearful con confession to John that they ever that they never found the horn, claiming that this is actually the genuine artifact that he found when he found the actual grave of Jorman. Mance then uh, goes on to basically explain his strategy. He's going to use the Horn of Winter as mutually assured destruction. He says it is totally, totally real. You better believe me, guys. But has not blown it because he wants to use the threat of the extinction of the human race at the hands of the others as leverage to get all his people on, all his people on uh, the Westeros side of the wall for the Night's Watch to let them through or else lose everything, basically. Uh, there's another quote here. It says, uh, this is from Dala. It was Dala who answered him. Dala, great with child, lying on her pile of furs beside the brazier. We free folk know things you kneelers have forgotten. Sometimes the short road is not the safest 
Jon Snow. A horn lord once said that sorcery is a sword without a hilt. There is no safe way to grasp it. So that's basically uh, reinforcing this idea. They don't want to use this apparently magic horn, but they will um, if you don't let them through. They're just holding the Night's Watch hostage. And it's a pretty reasonable strategy. Um, if Mance can convince the Night's Watch that it's real, they cannot risk it being blown, basically. Um, and it also works as a really good, like, double bluff, because if it is real, the Night's Watch will never find out, because they're not going to... Like, l let's play this out, just like as a mental exercise. Let's say it works. Mance and the Night's Watch come to agreement. He hands over the horn. They are lit through the wall. The Night's Watch is then not going to blow it to see if it's real, because if it's real, it's going to tear down the wall. So they essentially, if they can reach an agreement, Mance has a get out of free pass for forever. And this is now the horns of winter as far as everyone is concerned because they can't test it. Kind of a brilliant strategy. Um, oh, good point, let me be. Um, I wonder what the message the runes say. Good thing Sam is at the Citadel. True, if someone could read the first men runes, like Makoro translates the name on Dragonbinder. So that is a that is a very real possibility. Unfortunately, Stannis. <laughs> Just goddamn it, Stannis. You ruin everything. Stannis is the It's true. He is the worst. Uh the Wildlings are destroyed in the attack by uh Stannis and his uh and his troops. Mance and his great horn are taken captive, and the strategy of blowing it goes really nowhere. However, there is one very curious thing that probably goes against the idea that it is the real horn. Mance has claimed that Tormund will blow the horn in three days if their demands are not met and he will destroy the wall. However, as Stannis' troops attack, nobody goes to blow the horn, even as they are being destroyed. So this may suggest that Mance and the rest of his... Um, leadership are aware this is a fake horn and that blowing it would do nothing that essentially their bluff has been called whoops a daisy <laughs> sucks about that one uh accidentally upended by the uh by stannis and alessandra so after stannis is definitely not taking over the night's watch uh melisandre wants the ancient artifact burned alongside Mance in the Weirwoods as sort of a show of might for lore, but also from the opening quote, Melisandre fears this horn. She thinks if it's blown, it could take down the wall. So, uh, she doesn't exactly follow through on all these things. For instance, it's not really Mance Raider that gets burned. It's obviously um, Rattleshirt, but she does actually burn the horn, and we have the quote here. This one's very interesting. So it says, the horn of Jormund burst into flame and went up with a whoosh as swirling tons of green and yellow fire left up crackling all along its length. John's garrison shied nervously, and up and down the ranks others fought to still their mounts as well. A moan came from the stockade as the free folk saw their hope of fire. A few began to curse, began to shout and curse, but most lapsed in their silence. For half a heartbeat, the runes graven on the gold bland seemed to shimmer in the air. The queen's men gave a heave and sent the horn tumbling down into the fire pit. So that ends the tale of the horn of winter in A Song of Ice and Fire, right? That's it. The horn has been burned. Well, hang on a second. After Mance has been dispatched to Winterfell on his mission as Abel the Bard, Tormund is talking to Jon and he says this. Did she? Tormund slapped his thigh and hooted. I guess he did one of these. <laughs> a nice, a nice uh, northerner hoot. <laughs> that sounds like Tormund to me. She burned that bit, that fine big horn eye. A bloody sin, I call it. A thousand years old, that was. We found it in a giant's grave, and no man had ever seen a horn so big. That must have been why Mance got the notion to tell you it was Jormund's. He wanted you crows to think he had it in his power to blow your bloody wall down about your knees. But we never found the true horn, not for all our digging. If we had, every kneeling of seven kingdoms would have a chunk of ice to cool his wine all summer. 
John turned in his saddle, frowning, and Jorman blew the horn of winter and woke the giants from the earth. The huge horn with its bands of old gold and incised with ancient runes. Had Mance Raider lied to him? <gasps> or was Tormund lying now? If, horn, if Mance's horn was just a feint, where's the true horn? George asks the reader. Hey guys, that wasn't the real horn. That wasn't the real one, so where do you think it is? Oh, George, you clever, clever man with your love of turtles and your love of mysteries. Ah, good question. So George is again confirming the idea that Mance was just bullshitting the whole time. The horn was act. The horn that was burned was surely a big, magical-looking horn, but not the horn of winter itself. And at this point, I mean, Tormund has very little reason to lie anymore. That, um, you know, the, the game is over. They took the horn, they burned it. It doesn't matter if it was real or not. Whereas Mance previously had every reason to lie. His entire strategy was that the horn is real. No matter what, he had to convince the Night's Watch that it could do what he said. So, yeah, this was an amazing old horn, but probably not the real one. Uh, it's gonna check PayPal real fast. Up, oh, we're up to 118 likes, 176 watching. Thank you guys. Thanks for coming out. Um, I'm finish this section, do a little promo stuff. But again, slam that like button. Only 32 away from the new magical hat, which actually looks like the one in the uh, in the logo and stuff like that. Oh, uh, five dollars from Joanne Evans. Thank you, Joanne. Very, very generous of you. Love your live chats. Thank you. The horn will wake the sleepers, but who are the sleepers? Good question. When we get into that one later, uh, definitely addressing that one. Um, ooh, good question from Ed Pistemic. How many at the wall know Rattleshirt was burned? Not man's probably very few. Um, Melisandre, mostly Stannis, probably. Um, but it's a very small number that know that Mance is not dead. Uh, so where were we? Actually, this is something I wanted to bring up because um, uh, talking about Dragonbinder last week of the Z's and History of Westeros really brought up the similarities between Dragonbinder and this Horn of Winter that got burned. For instance, one of the reasons that we know that Dragonbinder was probably a horn of a dragon itself, is that it had the black color of iron, which we know that is the color of, um, of dragon bone. And look at the description here for the horn of winter or Mance's horn that got burned. It also has, it's also enormous. It also has the same black color. Um, it, it is also bound with precious metals. Whereas the dragon binder is bound with red gold, um, Mance's horn is as uh, old, kind of yellowish gold or brownish gold. They also both have runes carved into them. And when it is when it is blown, um, dragon binder itself essentially um, dragon binder like the runes light up. Right, it looks like it's on fire, and then. I just read the passage from when they burn Mance's horn and it looks like the same thing kind of happened as the fire went into the horn, the runes lit up. So that raises the question that maybe, I mean, it's suggested in the text that this may have come from a giant Oryx, the biggest one that's ever known, but maybe this was also a dragon horn. Maybe this was, um, one that was built in Westeros and not in Valyria. I mean, that would make, a few amount of sense. I mean, if we read the quote here from the description of Dragonbinder, compare it back, and it sounds almost one to one. Um, the horn he blew was shiny, black, and twisted, and taller than a man as he held it with both hands. It was bound with ba with bands of red gold and dark steel, incised with ancient Valyrian glyphs that seemed to glow redly as the sound swelled. So, those sound almost one to one. The descriptions between the two horns are very, very, very similar. So that'd be kind of cool if this was actually a dragon horn. Apparently, if you burn it, it turns uh, yellow and green in the fire. That'd be kind of cool, especially because there are suggestions that dragons uh, can't, were in Westeros at some point before the Valyrians. 
uh, Alan O the Oak, was it an an ice dragon binder? Very well could be. Um, maybe it's a hell maybe it's a hellhorn that got burned here. Um, this also could answer the question of well, when they were being attacked, why didn't they blow it? Well, perhaps they did earlier. <laughs> they tested it and realized, and it killed the blower, just like with Dragon Binder. Um, possible, but Torrin doesn't mention it, so maybe not. Um, but the the similarities between the two horns is definitely interesting. Definitely something to take a harder look at. There must be a turtle binder somewhere. Oh my god, George would love his turtle binder. His favorite house, Estermont. The turtles of his youth. Dude loves turtles. Actually, this is one of those funny things if you go back and read um, dream songs. His initial storytelling was essentially him making up stories about his pet turtles. And them playing the Game of Thrones and killing each other and all these wacky things, so... Another way to imagine A Song of Ice and Fire is replace every character with a turtle. And you may be close to how George imagines it. Yeah, good point, uh, Great Waste Then That'd be a big oopsie daisy if they destroyed a second dragon binder. I mean, perhaps. I think uh, if Melisandre knew what it really was, then I don't think she would have uh, burned it. But she seems, she believes the idea that this is the Horn of Winter has to be destroyed, even though everyone else knows that it's not. Whoops on Melisandre there. So, okay, so that wasn't the Horn of Winter, most likely. Um, Egret and Tormund are telling us that. George is telling us that. It is not, that was not the genuine McCoy, basically. Okay, so, but let's follow George's question from that quote earlier. If that wasn't the real one, where is it? Is it somewhere else in the story? Well, the answer is maybe. It may be some. <laughs> Mallory wants to draw Turtle a Song of Ice. Do it. Draw Turtle a Song of Ice and Fire. You would be that would be true to George's vision. He loves turtles. If you actually wanted to make like fan art that made it to him, I bet Turtle a Song of Ice and Fire would do it. He would treasure that. Loves turtles. Uh, let me just recheck. PayPal real fast. Okay, nothing there. Oh, so I want to do some uh, promo stuff. We're about halfway through the stream. So, um, again, thank you all for, uh, for hanging out, slamming that like button. 150 likes puts on the Brand new Joe Magician hat, 175 for the uh, George Turtle hat, 200 likes. I'll read a passage from the upcoming video, which I should have done this week. I got sidetracked by some IRL stuff, so my plan of getting it done last week did not happen, unfortunately. My bad. Sorry about that, guys. Um, unfortunately, IRL stuff does tend to come first. I also wanted to say thank you to the... Um, Patrons that have signed up since the last live stream. Um, so that would be. Let's see here. Uh, Maester Zen signed up at the Maester level. And Jen Snow, the queen of the Song of Ice and Fire board, she also signed up at the Maester level. Uh, thank you guys both for that. Um, as I said, the upcoming video is about what is Lady Stoneheart doing in the Winds of Winter other than just killing a bunch of Freys. I mean, killing a bunch of Freys is a lot of fun. Uh, from playing Crusader Kings, it is it is a blast taking vengeance on the Freys. And it's definitely part of what she's doing, but I have a theory about another sort of secret thing that she's attempting to do throughout uh, through the coming book. So that should be coming out this week. Uh, I've posted samples on the in the patron slack and also on Patreon for your um, people who have signed up to take a look at them. Uh, Chrissy of Old Stones, one of the mods of the chat and of many chats, obviously, honestly, a mod extraordinaire, uh, provided the voice work for that. She did a fantastic job. I'm really happy with uh, where it's coming out. Um, I 
Oh, uh, crushing t- crash Japan. It wasn't a bad thing. It wasn't a bad thing that kept me from um, from finishing the video. It was just I had I was busy with other things that unfortunately uh, kind of kind of got in the way. Um, you know that that's how it goes. After that, I'm gonna be doing a video about. Oh, by the way, the stream's not over. I'm just doing a little promo thing, and then we're gonna go right back into it. Um, so after that, I have a super secret project. I'm going to be working on it. And after that, I have to do the promised patron video uh, about Stannis. So that'll be a lot of fun. Um, you can also support me on patreon.com slash Joe Magician. Um, get access to content early. Like I was talking about, people have heard parts of the audio. Um, I've gotten hints about what it is, that kind of thing. They'll be seeing it before anybody else. It'll probably be going up as a premiere, that sort of thing. Um, also subscribe, hit the bell button. Uh, some of you I saw in the chat basically said like, oh my God, this is the first time I was able to catch you. If you hit that bell button um, down beneath the video and tell it to send you notifications, YouTube and the app will send you push notifications when I go live or when new content is uploaded. So that's that's a pretty good way to make sure you get that. All right, so uh, also definitely check out the collaboration with History of Westeros I did last week. Um, that was a lot of fun talking about uh, Victorian's chapter in the Winds of Winter. So definitely check that out. All right. So let's do this. Let's go back into. All right. So, yeah, th- that's not the Horn of Winter. That was not the Horn of Winter itself. That was another really cool horn that he found. Maybe a dragon horn, which would be awesome. But George is saying it's it might be somewhere else in the story. OK, so let's track this baby down. Let's find that Horn of Winter. <clears throat> the place that most people point to is in A Clash of Kings, John 4. And this is truly one of the strangest moments in A Song of Ice and Fire that has still not been explained in any real way and puzzles readers puzzles readers to this day and probably will for years to come. This is uh, at the Fist of the First Men. Ghost comes running up to John and essentially starts like almost dragging him out into the woods. Ghost has never acted like this before. It's totally out of character. Um, John doesn't know what's happening. And Ghost ends up leading John all the way to this weird um, this weird dirt pile and starts digging it up. John goes over, digs it up, and, with, and within it is a cache of weapons that have been buried in the ground and no explanation of where this came from because obviously ghost doesn't talk so don't really know what's going on we got the quote here it says a length of frayed rope bound the bundle bound the bundle together john unsheathed his dagger and cut it groped for the edges of the cloth and pulled the bundle turned and its contents spilled out onto the ground glittering dark and bright he saw a dozen knives leaf-shaped spearheads numerous arrowheads John picked up a dagger blade, feather light, and shiny black hiltless. Torchlight ran along its edge, a thin orange line that bespoke that spoke of razor sharpness, dragon glass, what the maesters call obsidian. Actually, one of these babies, uh, Clint of the um, Learned Hands podcast, gave me this one. Not actually real obsidian, unfortunately, but it looks cool, basically like this. <clears throat> um, a ghost uncovered some ancient cache of the children of the forest buried here thousands of years this of the first men was an old place only beneath the dragon glass was an old war horn made from an aurochs horn and banded in bronze john shook the dirt from inside it and a steam and a stream of arrowheads fell out he let them fall and pulled up a corner of the cloth the weapons had been wrapped in, rubbing it between his fingers. Good wool, thick, a double weave, damp, but not rotted. It could not have been long in the ground, and it was dark. He seized a handful and pulled it close to the torch, not dark, black. Even before John stood and shook it out, he knew what he had, the black cloak of a sworn brother in the night's watch. So, okay, let's go over what John just found, because this is 
again, completely bizarre. No explanation for what's going on here. We've seen into a dance with dragons. Still has not come up what this was, who gave it to John, why Ghost led him to it. Um, so we have a non-rotted and relatively new cloak of the Night's Watch, a fine one. Weapons to fight the others, which seemingly came from the Children of the Forest. Uh, we know Obsidian is their weapons. They make these kind of things. Um, and this old cracked war horn, which is bound in bronze and made from an oryx horn. Okay. That's kind of random. From At first blush, it seems like the weapons are the most important part. And then John also takes the horn and tries blowing it. He notices that it's cracked, and when he blows it, no noise comes out. So John's like, oh, neat. Somebody gave me a cracked, useless horn. Cool stuff. Now, this is actually, <laughs> let me be in the chat, uh, and other people in the chat are noticing, like, yeah, this sounds like it's from Bloodraven. And as I wrote in my outline here, Bloodraven intensifies uh, ghost's peculiar behavior, along with the Night's Watch cloak made of goodwill. It's also goodwill, goodwill, so it's thick and it's double weaved. It's not something that they give to um, somebody they don't care about in the Night's Watch. It sounds like the cloak of somebody high up, maybe the cloak of a ranger, somebody important. So maybe this is Blood Raven's old cloak, or maybe this is um, Benjamin Stark's old cloak, something like that. It definitely. Um, says that whoever used to own this thing was able to get the finer things at the Night's Watch. So again, somebody higher up, maybe somebody highborn. <clears throat> and this uh, this feels the base the the main reason that people think that this is the real Horn of Winter and not the other one is that th this is a a motif that has been used elsewhere. Um, most famously in Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Um, spoiler alert, if you haven't seen The Last Crusade, going to be giving up some of the last scenes in the movie. Um, I can't imagine who hasn't seen it at this point that wants to, but here we go. As they make way to the grail room where the immortal knight is standing guard, uh, Donovan is essentially told that he has to pick one of the grails dip it into the water and drink it. And if he chooses correctly, he'll be granted immortality more or less. But there's like 60 horns. I mean, there's 60 uh, grails around and he doesn't know what it looks like. He has no idea what the Holy Grail really is. Um, what ends up happening is uh, it gets chosen for him. I forget her name, but it's the, the German lady. And she picks for him the grail that is the absolute most ornate. It is beautiful. It has golden jewels all over it. He dips in the water, drinks it. It drains his life and kills him. Indiana Jones, on the contrary, being a historian, then um, chooses the most humble-looking cup, remembering that from um, history that Jesus and Joseph were not wealthy, but they were carpenters by trade. And Indiana Jones is correct. The, the cup of a carpenter rather than the cup of the king of kings. So the horn that gets burned and the horn that's being found here feels to many like this is an extremely similar idea that George is uh, referencing. That you have on one hand, you have the huge, impressive ringed with gold and runes carved into it horn. It's an item that lives up to the hype of what you think a magical, amazing object like the Horn of Winter would look like. But the horn that John finds may be the one that's more correct historically. Like, for instance, the wildlings themselves are not like master craftsmen like the Valyrians that would that make giant ornate trophies with uh, gold banded in it. They're relatively poor, and they're mostly known to work with bronze for the most part. And most of the weapons they have are stolen. So the idea that the Horn of Jorman, a very, very ancient king beyond the wall, would have this massive gold-bound object doesn't make a lot of sense. But the idea that the Horn of Jorman would be this very simple one made from an aurochs with bronze on it, especially since we know it's supposed to be ancient, that, that makes a lot more sense. Um, oh yeah, Donovan is also a Pycelle. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Pycelle dies in... 
<laughs> the last crusade, same as he does in the Song of Ice and Fire in Game of Thrones. So that's the that's usually the main evidence put forward that this horn is actually the real one, that this is the horn of winter. That if you think about it logically, the first one probably could not be it. <clears throat> so what happens to this horn afterwards? Well, John, as I said, John tries to blow it and nothing happens. It's cracked and he doesn't want to put in the effort to fix it, so he doesn't. What he does is, um, actually, we're only one like away. Somebody out there, slam the leg button. I get to put on my new hat. Uh, do you think the horn will be fixed in some way? Fixing the horn is a relatively simple fix. So the fact that it's cracked is weird. Um, it's it's not like it's not super difficult, I don't think, but it might be difficult to fix it so that it um it makes the same noise. But I mean, we're we're gonna get to that later. So this is the quote we have. Oh, there we go. A couple people slammed likes at time. Let me make sure I got it the right way. I got this off Etsy. This thing's huge. It goes like shoulder to shoulder on me. And I have I have broad shoulders if any of you actually some of you have met me have met me in real life. I am a tall guy. I have broad shoulders and this hat goes to goes shoulder to shoulder. Oh. It's actually so tall, it's not going to fit in the, in the in the shot. <laughs> oh, hang on. I have to fix this. It was uh, riding a little high. Ah, there we go. This is actually like, I would want to wear this while I'm like outside gardening and stuff like that. It's very soft. It's got a, it's very much a Gandalf hat. Take a look at this baby. It's wide. It gives you a lot of shade. Like if I didn't, if I wouldn't look like a doofus, I would definitely wear this outside. But I am a doofus. So should I do it anyway? <laughs> A lot better than the other one, which was way too small for me. And this one actually fits my fits my head, and it looks like the I actually commissioned it to look like the one uh, Mallory drew for me. Is that the Song of Ice and Fire miniatures game set you have on your shelf? Yes. Uh, this was actually a gift from one of the a Song of Ice and Fire mods that got it at Comic Con. Um, it's Jamie and Rob Stark from the miniatures. <laughs> There we go. The only problem is making sure it doesn't get too floppy. <laughs> Change to a dislike. How dare you, Jasper? I'm just kidding. There we go. Kind of something like um, Gandalf's hat, but more like uh, the sorting hat, but it's kind of my own thing. There we go. All right, so here we go. We got the uh, the quote here. It says, it must have been buried for a reason. He made the dagger for Gren as well and another for the Lord Commander. The war horn he had given to Sam. On closer examination, the horn had proved cracked. Even after he cleaned all the dirt out, John had been able to get any sound from it. So John immediately picked this thing up, cleaned it off, and tried to give it the old toot toot. Didn't work. No sound came out. Um, the rim was chipped as well. But Sam liked old things, and even worthless old things. So, Clever George, he's calling this horn worthless, when it may be the real thing. Actually, one thing that's bothering me is that, like, it's hitting off the top of my chair. Okay. <laughs> Somebody actually, I don't, here's the funny thing about just liking videos, it doesn't do anything. YouTube doesn't uh, doesn't stop recommending it because it gets disliked. You know, that's how it goes. It just wants interaction. Um, make a drinking horn out of it, he, John told him. Every time you take a drink, you'll remember how you ranged beyond the wall all the way to the fist of the first men. 
He gave Sam a spearhead and a dozen arrowheads as well and passed the rest out among his friends for luck. So that's essentially what happened to the horn. John gave it to Sam because he's a nerd and he likes weird old things, which is true. I would also probably take that from John. Sounds cool. Actually, I do have one. I have a, uh, this is a gift from my cousin for his wedding. So I actually have a, a drinking horn. Not exactly the same thing, but, um, Oh, good one, Jess. John will put his lips on anything he finds to be on a wall. He's a very orally fixated guy. What can you say? Um, <laughs> yeah, John John calls it worthless, and he knows nothing. Um, yeah, he gives it away. He doesn't care about it. Sam keeps it as a um, as basically a token to remember John by. And uh, as John says. It's just like a memory thing, so he doesn't he doesn't really care about it. Um, the we hear about it next when John is on where uh, Sam's on his way to Old Town. The quote goes: "By the time the dealing was done, Sam was down to his boots and blacks and small clothes, and the broken horn John Snow had found on the fist of the first men." Um, essentially, what happened at the end of the Cinnamon Wind is Sam had to essentially pay for his passage, so he pawned basically everything he had to the captain. And the one thing they didn't want was the stupid old broken horn that didn't make any sound. So jo so Sam's allowed to keep it for sentimental reasons. Um, so that's basically where the horn is today. Um, it's made its way to Old Town. Sam still has it, so it's in the Citadel. And... If this is the real Horn of Winter, man, George put shitloads of effort into delivering this thing all the way to Old Town. Like, narratively, think of all the effort he put into this. He made Ghost find it. He made somebody bury it. He made John find it. He then made John give it to Sam. And then Sam survived all the way the journey to Old Town. So, if it's important, it's he's done a lot of work to get it here. Uh, what Amanda says, what if you have to drink from it? Like a grail, maybe that's why we're giving strong illusions to the grail. Um, so how you would make it a drinking horn, I think you would just seal the end, um, where you would normally blow, you just essentially cap it and then you could turn it into a drinking horn. So it'd be pretty easy to do, but you'd have to fix the crack too. Um, otherwise it would link leak out while you're trying to drink it. But that's really it. Sam doesn't really think about it much more. John doesn't. He continues thinking about the Horn of Winter quite a lot. But this weird horn that he picked up and then gave to Sam. Nothing. Sam just thinks of it as a souvenir. That's kind of it. Um, so the big question here, the thing that George has been asking the reader over and over again, kind of the and the name of the stream is. So what does it do? <laughs> like, does it do anything? Um. I talked about this at length with uh, History of Westeros about what Dragonbinder does. The name, which Makoro translates for Victorian, implies that it binds dragons. But when it was previously blown, it just made the worst noise anyone has ever heard the king's moot. No dragons were bound. Of course, there are no dragons within earshot, so maybe it will in the future. Um, that's kind of the only example we have. For the supposed horn winter that Sam has, we've also seen somebody blow it. And again, nothing happened. Um, like less than nothing happened. Like nothing really happened when Dragonbinder was blown. It just sounded like the worst music anyone ever heard. John tries to blow it and nothing happens. Nobody can hear anything. There's no obvious effects. So this has led quite a lot of readers, myself included, and actually uh, Crowfood's daughter, uh, among others, have been going crazy on Twitter uh, talking about this, trying to figure out, like, all right, so th does it do anything? Like, can we, like, put together different pieces of these legends and these stories and try and, um, and try and figure out if George has laid the hints for its actual effects? So let's start with the, the basic thing, the thing we learn about it first, and that is the idea that it's not that it will bring down the wall. That is that is framed as a consequence. 
what we're told about the Horn of Winter is that when you blow it, it will wake giants from the earth. As I previously noted, John's a big of a dum-dum, and he thinks that it will literally wake giants from the earth. <sighs> Nopes. Nope, nope, nope. He later becomes convinced by Egret and Tormund that that horn was probably fake, and that the giants are just giants who are also scared of the others, so that's why they joined Mance. It had nothing to do with sorcery. So, literally, probably literally not true. There's no, there's no giants being woken when you blow that horn. Um, but we also, we get a colloquial use of the phrase giants from the earth in Westeros, and this comes from the world of ice and fire. This is from the section about the shattering of the arm of Dorne. So here we go. And so they did gathering in their hundreds, some say on the Isle of Faces and calling on their old gods, old gods with song and prayer and grisly sacrifice. A thousand captain, captive men were fed to the weirwood. One version of the tale goes, while another claims the children use their own, use the blood of their own young. Yikes, not great. And the old gods stirred, and giants awoke in the earth, and all of Westeros shook and trembled. Great cracks appeared in the earth, and hills and mountains collapsed and were followed and were swallowed up. And then the seas came rushing in, and the arm of Dorne was broken and shattered by the force of the water until only a few bare rocky islands remained above the waves. The summer sea joined the narrow sea, and the bridges between Essos and Westeros vanished for all time. Oh, time for another hat? You guys slammed that like button so hard. All right. Um, we'll get this one next week. Don't you worry. Hey, this one didn't screw up my hair. Because it's not as tight. It actually like fits my head. Hard to do. I have, a, I have a big head. It's pretty big. Let's go full germ on this one. Greek sailor hat engaged. <laughs> Thank you all for uh, slamming that like button. So that's what we have there. This is the other, uh, the other example of the phrase giants awakening in the earth. Um, the arm of Dorne is broken. Children of the forest sent a spot, sent a spell from the Isle of Faces with mass sacrifice and woke the giants from the earth. Old God stir, Westeros trembled. So that sounds a hell of a lot like uh, seismic activity. That sounds like volcanoes or earthquakes, like giant ass earthquakes. Um, and that makes a good deal of sense. Um, on our planet and in Georgia's, seismic activity with earthquakes and volcanoes are among the most powerful forces in the world. They have the ability to wipe out entire civilizations in minutes or hours. Um, they have the ability to completely reshape land masses in ways that can never be fixed. Um, like that's what we see with the Doom of Valyria. Doom of Valyria is taken out by volcanoes. That's it. Um, Volcanoes erupted, the greatest empire in the world disappears in an afternoon. So that's that's kind of the idea here. The, the phrase, I guess, in Westeros, waking giants from Earth is kind of a um a low science way of understanding what earthquakes are. Kind of like I don't I don't I don't know how you would like explain it, but maybe like giants punching up into the rock or something like that. Um current magician oh my god yeah the neck uh, also the hammer of waters has a similar idea where the, the land mass was broken water rushed in and and it turned into a marsh that's also consistent with earthquake activity or volcanic activity both of them do basically the same thing they usually actually go um for cataclysmic scales go one and one earthquakes and volcanoes follow each other like uh, obviously the ring of fire in the pacific ocean is not only a ring of volcanoes, it's a ring of where the most powerful earthquakes go. Um, oh, a uh, super chat here from Anders Graham, uh, 50 DKK. Do you think that the, do you think this means that the children made the horn? I was going to get to that, but it seems conspicuous that we have this one story of the children of the forest that did the same thing. And then we have the horn that has the same power or it's rumored to have the same power. So that would be my guess. It it sounds so much like earthquakes, sounds so much like volcanoes exploding. I mean, it's a real thing. You just have to like uh the Minoans, their civilization in the um, 
and the Mediterranean was wiped out by a massive volcanic eruption with earthquakes that followed. Um, yeah, fault lines. It's the most, it's honestly the most powerful and the most sudden thing that can happen on our planet. So I wouldn't be, and especially because the children are called the singers of the earth. Um, he's, he's drawing a conclusion that somehow they have the ability to cause earthquakes with mass sacrifice, I guess. No idea how that works. Like literal zero idea how you could do that. Um, But so that may tell us that the power of the Horn of Winter is that it creates earthquakes. If the uh, if the if the power is the same, and then if you created an, an, a big enough earthquake, then perhaps the wall could be destroyed by the shaking, or you could like, or maybe there's a fault line under it, or something like that. You never know. I mean, that's the most reasonable explanation for how you would destroy the wall, I guess, other than. Uh, a giant dragon blowing it with fire. That thing that happened. Um, oh, you've never experienced earthquakes, Adam Warlock? I grew up in partially in California, and there were earthquakes all the time. It is terrifying. It's completely out of control. And especially if you grew up in a place where you've never experienced one before, and you go to a place with lots of uh, earthquakes, it scares the absolute shit out of you the first time it happens. Um, they are, they are really scary, especially because they come out of nowhere and you have no idea because of the way they work. Um, there's a thing called aftershocks and pre-shocks where one earthquake can set off others. Um, it's, uh, it's not good. <laughs> it's very scary to go through. I remember the first one. I moved from the East coast to the West coast as a child. And the first earthquake that hit, I was like, what the, what the fuck's happening? What is this? So that's that's kind of what it can be like. I can imagine that's maybe what George was playing on here. Um, especially, it, it's this thing that sort of gets a fascination from people that have never experienced before. Like somebody that's never seen snow and goes to see snow is like, oh my god, this is amazing. So maybe a, the same kind of thing is happening. Um, a giant dragon blowing magic percussive fire. Sure. Maybe, the, maybe uh, dragons or any volcanoes blowing. That's kind of thing. Um, so perhaps that's the power of the horn of winter. You blow it and it creates a massive earthquake wherever you want. Um, which, as suggested by the uh, super chat, perhaps this means that the horn of winter is an artifact that was created with the power or the, um, the help of the children of the forest. That, or maybe this is the thing that caused the hammers of waters and the shattering of the arm of Dorn, that this is like the literal horn that caused those things. And the name Horn of Winter is just the current name for it. And that it's been used many times before. Um, and especially when you look at it, that it's, it's basically just a, a simple Orox horn that has been, that has bronze added to it with runes. There's no reason to think that that the that humans couldn't have gotten their hands on it and then added bronze to it. It could be a basic children of the forest artifact that has been modified by people. Um, do the children of the forest have instruments? Ooh, good question. I don't know about that one. They definitely didn't work metal. So any bronze that was added to it would have been added by the first men, which again works historically with the idea. Um, Maybe even caused the doom of Valyria. Yeah, the doom of Valyria is earthquakes and volcanoes. That's what caused caused it. So extremely scary stuff, especially when you see active volcanoes. Um, it's one of those things that really puts it in perspective, like how small and ins insignificant you are uh, compared to like the force of these things. So, but this creates a major, major problem. So let's say that's what it does. Let's say the Horn of Winter, you blow it, it causes a massive earthquake wherever you are or wherever you want it to be. Uh, the story goes that the children blew it from the Isle of Faces and caused Dorne to explode. So you don't really need to be nearby, according to the stories, if it has to work. But there's a big flaw in this. Jorman, the king beyond the wall, supposedly blew the horn once, but the wall still stands. So the logical problem here is that if he did blow it, 
that means the effect is not destroying the wall or that he never actually blew it. Those are, those are kind of the only options we have here. Um, if it creates a massive earthquakes and destroys everything, then he can't have done it. At least that's kind of the, the logical inference there. It's the same thing as John. John picks it up, blows the horn. There's no earthquakes, no wall shattering. So something's wrong with it. Something's wrong with the understanding of it. <clears throat> oh, uh, $20 from Maura Lee. Uh, thank you again, Maura. Very, very generous of you. Would black blood sacrifice be needed for this to work? Well, if we're looking at Dragon Binder, I was going to get to this in a little bit, but we know that um, Makoro tells Victorian that in order to bind the Dragon Binder to himself away from his brother, that there's some kind of blood sacrifice involved. And then I think that's why Victorian's rubbing his blood on the horn. It's his, like his idea of why, how to make it work. I mean, Victorian's probably wrong, but all sorcery, Valyrian sorcery is based in fire and blood, basically. That's the quote. So I would not be shocked if, um, if the Horn of Winter has some kind of thing that hasn't been working. Um, yeah, so John blows it, Jorman blows it. The wall has not fallen either time. So we also get uh, very conflicting stories about Jorman as a historical figure. In one story, he attacked the wall and was defeated, like so many other kings beyond the wall have tried and failed to have tried and failed to do. In another story, he actually made it through the wall, supposedly using his horn in some way, but then was defeated by the lords of Winterfell. Although this could be a corruption of multiple legends over time. For instance, Raymond Redbeard did make it south of the wall, as did Bale the Bard, and I believe Gendel and Gorn. So maybe Jorman's ancient status has caused him to absorb the stories of other people. That happens all the time. Um, but the other tale we get about Jorman, this is a very, very strange one. Not only did he supposedly fight the Night's Watch, he supposedly fought the Night's King, the Night King himself. The story goes that, and this is something that the, um, I believe it's from Old Nan tells this story, or it's from the World of Ice and Fire. I forget the source on this one. Strike that. I don't remember. But the story goes that Jorman is the king beyond the wall that helped Brandon the Breaker to defeat the Night King at the Night Fort. Um, so there's a lot going on here with Jorman if it was really one person. And also important to note that in none of these stories is it mentioned that Jorman actually blew his horn. Um, it's not like he fought the Night's Watch, blew the horn, and lost, or he fought the Night's Watch, blew the horn, and went through, or he fought the Night King, blew his horn, and won. Those are separate from the idea that he blew the horn. So, creates a lot of um, logical problems along with the idea that, you know, what does it actually do? The one thing I do find really interesting is that Jorman aided Brandon the Breaker in taking down the Night's King at the Night Fort. So we have a, a link there that is uh, repeated in A Song of Ice and Fire that there's something about the Horn of Winter with the King Beyond the Wall that has something to do with the others through the Night King. Um, especially because that is how George uses it. Mance goes to find the Horn of Jorm and the Horn of Winter because the others are about to kill them. It's the threat of the others that makes him want to go find it. and. That is really the motivating thing that is going all throughout John's story, the Night's Watch story, the Northern plotline. It's the idea the others are back and Mance is trying to save everybody from them. And the only way you can think of is to get this horn. So, again, we have this, this strange connection between all these things kind of um, like flowing around each other in George's narrative. So, you know, long story short with, uh, with Jorman and his blowing of the Horn of Winter, um, it doesn't, it doesn't tell us much. Um, if he blew it, then it doesn't bring down the wall. If he does, if he didn't blow it, then it doesn't tell us anything about what it does now. Um, all that it implies that somehow Jorman was involved with the others, uh, like fighting the others in some way and then fighting the Night's Watch, which is what we see Mance doing. So it's like, 
Is it just like a narrative like circle that George is using? He's using this old story to tell us about what Mance is about to do. Or is it, it's hard to draw out the exactly what's going on here. Uh, this is actually something that uh, Amanda or Crowfood's daughter brought up on Twitter that I thought was really interesting that another example of this in Northern culture is that there is very much an idea that horns are very important, but they're very important in reference to the others. So, you know, elsewhere in the Northern legends and songs, they have very prominent roles. The main example of this is that the Feast of Winterfell all the Northmen are singing about um, the song, The Night That Ended, which, of course, George does not give us the words to because it would give away way too much about what he's going to try and do later on. But this song is basically about the end of the long night. And at the very, very end of it, Hothor Umber gets out his giant war horn, which is banded in silver, and plays it extraordinarily loud. He blows on it as hard as he can to the point that all the dogs go running, basically. So the fact that Hothor did this only for this song implies that it's a known thing that when you finish the song The Night That Ended, somebody has to play a horn really, really loudly. So that may be a way of inferencing that something that had to do with the fall of the others in the end of the long night had to do with a horn which would line up in a very um, indirect way with the idea that Jorman, the guy who blew the horn, also took down the Night King. So maybe this is a two, um, like a monomyth idea where from both sides of the wall, you get the story that yes, there was a horn of some kind that was involved with the ending of the others on the long night. Great catch by Amanda. Um, as always, her, Ability to see details is astounding. Chef's kiss. <clears throat> um, and then also, in the Night's Watch Oath, there is this peculiar line of something they have to say. They say, I am the fire that burns against the cold, the light that brings the dawn, the horn that wastes the sleepers, the shield that guards the realms of men. The other ones make sense, but what the hell is the, the horn that wakes the sleepers mean in terms of the Night's Watch? What did it, what is that about? Like the light that brings the dawn. Yes, they fought um, the war of the dawn against the others. I am the fire that burns against the cold. The cold is the others. I am the shield that arms the realm of men. Yeah, they're a military force that protects against the return of the others. But a horn that wakes the sleepers. What? What? What is that about? Um, if you want to talk about it like super figuratively, you could say that like maybe the sleepers are like the rest of Westeros and they're the only ones that are awake. But I mean, like that doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, but it does sound a little bit like the idea of the Horn of Winter, which uh, wakes the giants from the earth. There's an idea that there are some, there's something asleep that when you blow a horn, it comes awake. Um, yeah, this could also be like rousing men to action, but it's like, it doesn't really fit with the others. Um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a weird line. So like, there's a lot of ideas obviously around the, the Night's Watch and fighting on the others that has to do with necromancy and the literal undead. So could that mean that? Could that have something to do, does that link in some way with the idea of waking the giants? It seems to infer in the same way that the, the, um, the song, the, um, what is it? What is it called? The Night That Ended also features some kind of horn that has to do with the end of the long night. Okay. Kind of makes sense. Um. Waking the dead, yeah, that could be another explanation other than um, raising the alarm, which, yeah, I, I guess so. It That does fit, too. Good point. You got me. But also, this this one, you can't ignore the fact that necromancy and that the idea of sleepers is another way that people talk about the dead. Um, so that could be like a double or triple meaning to that one. So perhaps... 
I don't know. Um, like, for instance, when you say waking giants from the earth, if you try to think about that literally, what does that mean? What does it mean to wake giants from earth? Well, does that mean like they're in like caves or something? Does that mean they're like underground? Are you like bringing back giants from the graves? Because like if you said you were waking somebody from the earth, that sounds like they're buried, which sounds like the undead. Um, you know, the, the others obviously control the undead. So yeah, it's, it's, it's a strange one. There's a, there's a lot of weirdness around horns and the others that is, which is kind of a, a running theme when you go from Jorman to the night that ended and this night's watch, this night's watch part of their oath. Like they don't have to be literal, but they could just hint at a larger idea between them. So this kind of gets us down to the the big question beyond what does it do? Um, and these are kind of linked. Why do you, why was this given to Jon Snow? Okay. Like if this is the real Horn of Winter, if this is the real McCoy, why was this put into this weird gift package and given to Jon instead of anybody else? So um the general idea is that it was probably Blood Raven that did it. Um especially because of Ghost's weird behavior. He may have been warging Ghost, and that's how he brought him to it. But this is one thing that um, comes up when you discuss about the Horn of Winter itself and that it's in Sam hand, Sam's hands now. It was not given to Sam. If Bloodraven wanted to give this package to Samwell Tarly, he could have done it later. Because Cold Hands, who is a servant of Bloodraven, finds Sam and brings him south of the wall. So this this is a thing that could have been um accomplished later and it's only days apart. So for some reason this and it wasn't like Ghost ran up to Sam to go get him, it ran up to John. So Bloodraven wants John to have this thing, which John then promptly gives away because Jon Snow knows nothing. Um Yeah, I mean, and Cold Hands saves Sam and then he transports Bran. So if Cold Hands is the one that buried it, then he obviously had it in his possession. He could have given it away to Sam when he brought him south of the wall. Um, it's it's a weird convoluted sequence of events if it's meant to be in Sam's hand the whole time. If he's meant to take it from John and then go to Old Town. Um, I would guess that that's like a mistake or something, that John messed it up in somehow. Because John immediately does. Also, there's the idea that if this horn is meant to do something, <laughs> John picks it up and blows it like literally the second he can. Um, so if this horn of winter is so important and it has to be given to Jon Snow in particular, why is it broken? Or why didn't you also give him instructions on how it's supposed to work? Because John picks it up, he cleans off the dirt, it's a cracked horn, and he, he tries blowing it, nothing happens. Um, and there's, <laughs> there's no explanation on what he's doing wrong. So that's, that's a big flaw in whatever plan this is. Um, uh, um, so... <laughs> Yeah, that, that's kind of a tough one. Why give John a broken horn that doesn't work? Um, but it's also the fact that you're giving it to John with the implication that it's going to be useful somehow. Everything else in that package is a useful um, thing for the Night's Watch against the others and the oncoming war. Like, there's arrowheads, there's daggers, there's spear tips. Like, those are all super useful. The horn should be useful too then, right? Like, why give it to him? I don't think you're giving it to him because it's like a neat keepsake from your time being a Night's Watch Ranger. Like, it should do something, but it doesn't. Or, this is actually something Amanda and I were talking about on Twitter. Um, <clears throat> so, John has demonstrated no hidden ability to recognize magical objects or repair them. He didn't pay attention a whole bunch in history class with Maester Lewin, and he doesn't know what it is, and he instantly gives it away. So 
the idea is that if you're giving it to John, you have to understand that he's not going to do anything with it. Like, uh, I mean, he's not going to fix it. He's not going to know what it is because you're not telling him. Which implies that maybe the horn does work. <clears throat> maybe it did work when John blew it, but we he didn't understand how. I look so good in the hat. Oh, thank you. Uh, just not in the way that we expect or much in the way the dragon binder did not um, bind any dragons because there were no nearby. Maybe the Horn of Winter when John blew it did do something. Um, actually, somebody brought up in the chat earlier the idea of a dog whistle where it's a whistle you blow that it's not just a um, <laughs> it's not just a, a way of uh, a political term. It's a real thing. You blow the whistle and it's too high for our ears, our ears to hear, but dogs can hear. And it sounds like high pitched, awful noise and they react very strongly to it while humans do nothing. So maybe that's what happened here. Maybe the Horn of Winter did make a noise, but it's not something Jon Snow could hear or not anything that the humans could hear. Um, because when you look at the sequence of events that happen around John finding this horn, so he finds it, he cleans it off, he blows it, and then he goes back to the fist of the first man, and then he immediately leaves with Corrin Halfhand. But almost hours later, the Night's Watch is, in, is attacked in force by the others. They send everything they have to kill them at the fist of the first man, and it's only sheer luck that Samuel Tarly... And Small Paul and a few others even escape. Everyone else is killed. Um, well, not everyone, but most of them are killed. And the stragglers make their way to Crash Deer's Keep. Um, so if you think about it that way, and we know, well, we can surmise from the other stories that maybe the Horn of Winter has something to do with the others. Maybe it was John blowing the horn that made them attack. Um... The sequence of events is very, very strange. Um, so let's think about it that way. Instead of going at it from the idea of the myths and legends about what it can do, look at the sequence of events. So John blows it, the others attack. They think he's there. He's not. He's left with Corrin Halfhand. So does that mean that the horn is somehow a threat to them? Like, does it do something to them? that they really, really, really don't want to happen. Um, especially with the linking of Jorman defeating the Night King with Brandon the Breaker and his blowing his horn, maybe some, maybe it did something to the Night King in order to um, make his defeat happen. That would be kind of an interesting way of weaving together these different stories. Um, so my idea, this is very, very tinfoil, I mean, all of this tinfoil, because we don't really know. John is telling us that it doesn't... I mean, George is telling us that the effects are unknown, and if it gets blown, it who knows what it does. Maybe earthquakes. Earthquakes is probably the most... Um, I think it, the earthquakes is the most reasonable explanation, but it doesn't really, doesn't really work with the other ones. So my suggestion is that the idea of the waking the giants from the earth and waking the sleepers and the connection of the Night King with the horn and also the attack that the others immediately throw at the fist of the first man when John blows it is that it in some way, much like dragon binder dr binds dragons, maybe the horn of winter is a thing that um, either binds the others or it hurts their magic somehow. Um, like for instance, if you take it literally and you say, um, you know, it wakes the sleepers well, what if you blow the horn and it causes like um, all the undead creatures around you to instantly fall apart? Like maybe the spell is broken and their armies are gone. Or what if you blow it and the others have to obey you? Um, that's a that would be fairly interesting and explain why they've been they apparently have been watching and waiting for the night's watch at the fist of the first men for a while. It's not until after the horn is blown that they even attack. 
if they realize the Night's Watch had this thing, that it makes total sense if it's a threat to them that they have to get rid of it. And it would also make sense why you give it to John. Like, think this through. You're Blood Raven. You have the Horn of Winter. You know it's real. You know what it does. If it actually brings down the wall, destroy it. Like, don't, don't give it to anybody. Just break it. Because you don't want the wall to come down. But if it's a weapon, if it's a thing that can be used against the others, then there's a real purpose in getting it into the hands of the Night's Watch and Jon Snow. Um, it also like wakes the old gods in some way. This could all just be ways of talking about the idea that um, it, af it affects magically things around you. Also, the, uh, another idea for it is that maybe it wakes the dead or it, it instead of making all the dead fall apart, maybe it binds all the undead to you, much in the same way that Dragon Binder maybe drags, binds dragons to you. Imagine if you're facing the others, right? And they're sending you their horde of the undead at you and you blow the horn of winter and all their soldiers now obey you instead of them. They would hate that. And that's a very useful weapon. Um, especially when you look at other artifacts, magical artifacts, artifacts we see within the A Song of Ice and Fire, um, like glass candles are basically artificial green sight. That's what it is. That's all it's doing. Dragon binder seems to be artificial dragon bond. Like if that's, if the name and the suggestions are true, that's what it does. It'd be super interesting if that's kind of what the Horn of Winter was. It's an artificial way of duplicating the other's power or negating it in some way. Otherwise, I, I don't really understand what the point is of Blood Raven giving it to John, who then gives it to Sam and then brings it to Old Town. Because why would Blood Raven want the wall to come down? You know? Oh, yes. Uh, good call, Curtis Franks. Uh, Jorman reminds me of, um, I'm not going to be time to pronounce that, but it's the giant sea snake from um, from Norse mythology. The legends vaguely line up. And that's one of the, th the inspirations, I think, that we're going at here. Um, within Norse mythology, the start of Ragnarok is started by Heimdall. The, um, he's, he's in the Thor movies, essentially, as like a guardian of the Bifrost, but he's more like a character that... Um, has the gift of foresight and kind of has a lot of knowledge. And it's when he blows the Gallarhorn that Ragnarok kicks off basically. And that's when the start of the long winter happens and the end of the world. <clears throat> so the idea that George may be doing a take on the Gallarhorn with the, with the horn of winter would kind of make some sense but also like for what it actually does i don't know like i know and there are a lot of theories out there that um i know poor quentin is one that has put this forward quite a bit that he thinks that euron is going to take the horn of winter up the high tower and blow it and that's how the wall will come down um it seems like such a dangerous thing if that's really what it does <laughs> that I don't understand why you would put it in the hands of, of John through ghost like that. I don't get it. Whereas the idea, if it's a weapon, like imagine, okay, so it's now in old town. So think about the idea that maybe Sam learns how it works. He blows it. Right. Imagine if like Euron is attacking and Sam calls back from the dead, all the dead of Old Town. They all rise from their graves and start attacking Euron or something like that. Or they start attacking everybody. That would be kind of an intense scene. Or if Euron gets a hold of it um, and that's what he ends up doing. That'd be kind of cool. Oh, a super chat here from the Happy Masquerader. Couldn't they also sense the horn is being used and want to take it from the Night's Watch so they can use it against the wall? Um, that is something I've thought about before. But there's something interesting about the, the horn of winter. So if you want to blow a horn, you have to have lungs. You have to pass air through it. Um, the others don't have lungs. They don't 
have the ability to uh, speak in the same way we think of. They speak what's called scraw, which is like, it's kind of sounds like ice cracking. So it may be that the others can't blow it. It may be designed specifically as an object that is something they can't use. Uh, Joanne Evans, $5. Oh, thank you for the super chat, by the way. Uh, thank you for the $5. The Stark Dead. So that's another one. Um, if it calls back the dead, it could definitely be used on the Crypts of Winterfell in some kind of, um, some kind of future scenario where Sam ends up back in the north, I guess, and at Winterfell and decides to blow it for some reason. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not really sure, but I, I definitely like the idea that it's something the others don't want to blow that it's like a weapon against them because that kind of makes the most sense for why you get it out, why you get it, you get it far away from the others as far as you can, especially if blood Raven knows that his time is limited. If he knows that the, that hold the door is coming and that he's going to die soon or something like that, then getting it far away from them kind of makes some sense. Um, Did John blow the horn at the same time the crazy dragon thing burned at Winterfell? I'm not sure. You'd have to look back at the um, the timing of the chapters. Uh, Crofi's daughter says, what if there's something worse than the others? The White Walkers were created to stop the, arms of the, the armies of men. What would be worse than the others? Like uh, the Eldritch Apocalypse, I guess. If like Cthulhu came through our gate and started destroying everything, I suppose. Um, so we're gonna, I'm going to go into the questions I got. A lot of people have a lot of things to say about like a lot of theories and questions about what it's going to do in the winds and winter and if it actually works, what it will do. So this is probably a good time to do it. Um, uh, from earlier, morally, she says, does Sam Tarly have the horn of winter with him? Possibly that may be the Horn of Winter with him. Blowing the horn awake the Stark Kings down in the crypts to fight for Winterfell like the dead men of Dunharrow did in the Lord of the Rings trilogy. So if it's anything like the, the shattering of the Arm of Dorne or the Hammer of Waters, then maybe it doesn't have to be nearby to use it. But the only example we've seen of somebody blowing it had nothing happen. So if it gets blown and if it wakes the Stark Kings down in the crypts, somebody's going to have to figure out it's the Horn of Winter, also how to repair it, also how to use it. Um, but it would be, I think definitely there's a lot of foreshadowing that the Stark Kings down in the crypts and, well, not just the Kings, there's, there's tons of people down in the crypts. It's not just the Kings. The Kings get the statues. Um, I think there's a lot of foreshadowing that the, that at some point in the Winds of Winter or Dream of Spring, much like in the show, probably better than the show, honestly. The show one was kind of weird. They just had them come to life and attack everybody. But that the um, there's definitely foreshadowing that John will find himself down in the crypts and that the uh, Kings of Winter are going to come back to life. Um... One thing that I that I said about Dragonbinder that I think is true about the Horn of Winter too, if this is the real one, um, it's that it would be an enormous waste of narrative time and space on the page for George if he spent all these chapters, all this time hyping up the Horn of Winter and it literally can do nothing. It probably does something, um, but it's going to take... Like, is it going to be like Sam researching in the library to find a book with a picture of the Horn of Winter? Um, you'd think if there was a, something like that, it would probably be at Castle Black. But there's nobody left there to look at it, so it would have to be Sam, I suppose. Um, so that could be... It should do something, much like Dragonbinder. It would be such a big fake out to spend four books hyping this thing up to have it do nothing. Um, so let's see here. He doesn't normally do huge fake outs like that. His fake outs with magical objects tend to be that they do things you don't expect. 
rather than they do nothing. Um, so that would be my guess. Like that, that seems to be kind of the fake out that's going to be happening um, with probably Valyrian Steel and Dawn that like they are powerful. They just don't do what you think. Um, so this is a question from Grey Waste Tim. Um, he said on Twitter, uh, not mean to interrupt with other people's theories, but one in that in deep geek was had that Sam only has half the horn. The other half is buried in the Winterfell crypts and will be found by Mance Raider. This harkens back to when Jorman and another king beyond the wall teamed up with Bran the Breaker to take down the Night's King. Half the horn left north the wall, the other half up south in case the Lord of Winterfell would have to ally with the Free Folk again. Waking giants would mean the stone statues in the crypts like stone mechs. Okay. The waking giants from Earth part relating to statues I'm 100% on, but I do love the half stays with us, half stays with you between the Free Folk and the Northmen. It's like a tree that was forgotten and broken years later. Um, just like with the Children of the Forest and maybe the White Walkers. Um, Did he explain why he thought it was broken in half? I mean, it's cracked down the side. It's not it's not like jagged like somebody broke it that way. Um It's yeah, it's cracked. It's not really I don't think it's half a horn. That would be a cool idea. Um but I don't I don't Why would it wake the the stone statues? Is that just meant to be like uh a take on Waking giants from the earth, I guess, because they're made of stone. Um, hmm. I'm not sure about that one. <laughs> uh, it sounds it sounds like it would be a cool plot. I just don't know wh what that's based on. Like, I don't think there's any story that Brandon the Breaker and Jorman split anything. And in fact, it seems like after they fought the Night's King... Jorman came back and fought against the Lords of Winterfell again, so it doesn't really seem like um, there's much cooperation between them afterwards. That if there was a relationship, it, sh it uh, shattered. Um, could be misremembering everything Robert said. Well, that'll happen. There's a lot of long streams and videos and that kind of stuff. Um, Lady Rosalie Valarin, why put their faith in John so early? So this is something that. Um, Amanda and a few other people in the thread were talking about if this is Blood Raven, if Blood Raven has the Horn of Winter, he puts it in John's hands. One thing you can't discount is his ability to see into the future, kind of like a Heimdall figure, where if he gave it to John, you'd have to assume it was for some reason. Like it's almost for certain that Blood Raven knows that John is the child of Rhaegar and Lyanna. And that he may be some kind of child of destiny sort of figure. So it may have been the intention to put the horn in his hands for some future event. But one thing that I always want to stress about Bloodraven and the way that he interacts with time and like future is that um, it doesn't seem like the Green Seers have the ability to see perfect visions of the future but they have the ability to see perfect visions of the past. So it could be that Blood Raven is aware of who John is and put the horn in his hands, thinking that he'll need it in the future, not realizing that John wouldn't recognize it at all and essentially give it away. It'd be kind of like a very Blood Raven move to try and set something like that, like that up and have it be, have it blow up in his face. Um, Adam, Adam Warlock, you keep saying that. I don't know what you're talking about. Like who else? would have given him the horn and who would have made ghost act in a weird way. I mean, there is evidence. You just, you just don't think it's true. Cool. Um, Amanda says, well, Euron does seem to be the third active villain. He is setting up something big and horrible with Euron in mind. Definitely. Um, the idea that horn is going to be around Euron is super interesting. It would be, I think the idea of him blowing it to break down the wall sounds really awesome. That'd be cool on page. It would also be really cool if he um, if he blew it and then it just like turned him into an other where he got like control of a whole bunch of corpses and stuff like that. Um, 
I think both would be fairly awesome uses of the horn in winter, to be honest. Um, especially since he seems to want to be one of the others. If a horn lets him fake it, then that'd be pretty awesome. Um, what's worse than White Walker is an ice dragon. Oh no, undead Viserion. Um, let me compare the stone statues of Crypts of Terracotta Army. Oh, that's right, the Terracotta Army. Um, isn't that a thing from one of the Mummy movies that those things came to life? <laughs> with with Brendan Fraser, like the Tomb of the Dragon King or something like that? Oh, that'd be amazing. Um, uh, let's see here. Oh, so here we go. We've got a question, bunch of questions here from Eric F. Uh, he says, how the others get south of the wall? How did they before? Um, that, that, that is the one big reason people think the Horn of Winter will bring down the wall. Because as far as we know, there's no other mechanism. George has not layered anything else in there for how they do it. Um, as far as we can tell, they are totally stuck behind it. If they could break it, they would. So they ha that they haven't says that they can't. So they're waiting for something. Uh, Dan and Dave in the show um, introduced the idea of them turning Viserion into a whited dragon and using his fire to break it down. I mean, that is one solution to the problem. I don't know if that's the one George is going to do. The Horn of Winter is the one he's directly said will do it. Um, but I don't know. It, it's It's hard to see how somebody will take the horn of winter when it's probably an old town and recognize it fix it and learn how to use it for the other to break the wall so the others can get south um unless euron has been getting like visions or he has knowledge he hasn't said yet that's basically he's basically like the x factor there um sam doesn't know how to do it so euron or maybe somebody in the citadel does The third Mummy film. Oh my god, yeah, there's three of those things. And then they did a reboot, I think. Oh, first one was the best. Love the first Mummy. Um, one thing that um, I did see brought up was the idea that like they have to have like special blood to blow it or something like that, and for it to work. But John blew it. Doesn't he have the most special blood, basically? Like, the most magical blood you could possibly have? So, um, I don't know. If that's the answer, I don't understand why it didn't work when John did it. Um, if it's supposed to bring down the wall. Maybe it's like... Uh, actually, this was something that uh, Crowfoot's daughter brought up on Twitter, that maybe he didn't blow it enough times. I mean, he had to blow it three times. Much like the Night's Watch tradition that you have to... It's uh, was it three blasts for the others. And it's the same thing with Dragon Binder. Euron has the um has his roommate, I think, blow it three times. Uh Victorian's also playing to blow Dragon Binder three times at the Battle of Fire. So maybe John just tried to gave up. If he had blown it three times, maybe the wall would have come down. Could be. Um that's one of the things where it's so shrouded in mystery and George has given us so little to about it that um not really sure. It also would raise the question, why would Sam blow it three times at Old Town? Why would Euron take it and then decide to blow it? I mean, there's a, there's a big gap of knowledge in characters around this horn for it to be real. Um Also, the idea that he, that the dragon binder kills whoever blows it three times. So, yeah, good call, MEB. Like the idea that it would work differently from a fire ride. So maybe John in the future blows it, and then it will work. That'd be kind of cool. Like, what if Lady Stoneheart got her hands on it, or what if uh, or Melisandre got her hands on it? What would happen if they blew it? Like characters that are objectively magic. That'd be kind of fun. Um, let's see here. Is the horn broken? It makes no noise by Bran the Breaker. Does Sam fix it? Does Mance find a companion? So this is uh, Robert's idea. So that's what Eric is referencing here. Uh, the idea that there's a companion piece 
that's in the Winterfell crypts. Um, it's broken along the side, I think. I don't think it's broken like that. I don't think somebody broke it in half uh, from the description we got of it. Um, I That's one of those... That's trying to solve a different mystery, I think, right? That's trying to solve why Mance wants to go down to the crypts so much. Um, he keeps asking Theon about it when he's at Winterfell. Um, I, I guess so. I mean... If there's actually half a horn down there, then that would make sense. He'd be trying to find it, but he doesn't have the other one either. So I don't really know how it helps him, you know, like he's not aware that Samwell has the other half of the horn in winter. So what does it get him? And they're on the other side of the wall already anyway. Like that's part of the thing. John let them through. So why would he need it anymore? Uh, Adrian Burchell, why would Blood even want the wall brought down? Exactly. Adrian, why? Why would he want this? Unless this is some kind of like long-term children of the forest plan where it's like he's trying to destroy the realms of men so that Bran will become king afterwards. Um, that'd be pretty grim even for Blood Raven uh, if he was willing to sacrifice presumably hundreds of thousands of people for the Weirwood King to rise in the end. But you never know. Um, If it doesn't take down the wall, is it a weather device that temporarily clears out the other's unbearable uh, cold winds so humans can actually fight them? That's part of the thing I was talking about earlier, that maybe it, like, negates the other's powers. Like, for instance, when you look at the creation of the others in the Children of the Forest, what is the other's biggest weakness? Obsidian. Obsidian kills him dead. Sam just, like, stabs him with one dagger, and that other falls to pieces. So the children clearly, when they made their magical constructs, created kind of like a safety valve for them that they gave them the one weakness of which is the weapons they use so maybe the horn of winter was intended as another fail-safe device that like if you're being attacked and you're the children of the forest and you have this horn you blow it and it stops them some way that would make um that would make a lot of sense with their previous behavior with their creations Um, half a horn is better than nothing. I guess you could turn it into a dope drinking horn if you have the top half. Uh, let's see here. Another one from Eric. He says, do you think the fake horn that Stannis burned actually was capable of doing anything? Actually, yes. I think it probably was a magical horn, a real magical horn. It's just, um, didn't do anything. Like nobody tried to use it. So they never found out. Um, like when it was burning, it turned weird colors and then the, the runes shimmered and then all the horses and stuff were like really freaked out by it being burned. So that's George's way of telling us there probably was real magic in the other horn, but it just wasn't the horn of winter. Like, um, like I was talking about earlier, maybe it was another dragon binder or something like that. Um, especially since they found it in giant's graves. That's the confusing part. Um, they found that thing in... Actually, I forget the phrasing, but they found it in a grave somewhere. It'd be kind of cool if it was another dragon binder. That was the one that Stannis burned, not realizing it would actually really help them. Presumably. I mean, who even knows what dragon binder does? Hey, Austin Felden. Um, uh, so another question here from Eric. Why must there always be a Stark in Winterfell? Is the reason connected to the horn? I think, um, I don't think it's like a magical thing. I don't think the idea that there has to be a Stark in Winterfell means that like when they all leave, like something breaks in the world. I would guess that it's just a, um, Starks for their many, many flaws. One of the things they do really well is they, um, bring stability to the North. And that's one of the, one of the things we learn about them is that after the Boltons come over, take over, there's, um, there's a, there's a line somewhere where somebody says, um, when the Starks were in Winterfell, a maid could walk in her name day suit from the wall to Winterfell and nobody would harass her, but now there's bandits and stuff everywhere. And so I think that phrase probably references that, um, the Starks in Winterfell are better for the North than not having them there. But I mean, I don't, I don't know what the magical reason would be. Like, they've been gone for quite some time now. 
Um, the others were starting before there were no more Starks in Winterfell. So I'm not, if there's an effect, I don't really know what it is. Like the wall hasn't fallen without a Stark in Winterfell. So I think it's just a, I think it's just a saying to emphasize how important they are to Northern culture. (laughs) Stark flaws. What is this? Ah, uh, you have to read about the old Starks and all the terrible things they did and the many people they killed and captured and, yeah, they were not good guys. They are now. Well, they're okay as far as feudal lords go. But anyway, um, another one from Eric. He said, did Benjen or Cold Hands bury the stash that Ghost uncovered? Is Benjen alive? So those are the two real possibilities. One is it's Cold Hands and one is it was it was uh, Benjen. So I'd, if it's Benjen... So let's think this through. Let's say it's Benjamin Stark, and he buried all that. Um, he buried all those daggers, those gra- dragon glass spears, the um, the arrowheads, and the horn. Right? Let's say he did that. Where did he get them? Because George has responded. There's a famous thing in the Dance with Dragons or Storm of Swords um, manuscript, where his editor asked him if Cold Hands was Benjamin, and George said no. So they, they're not the same character. So if Benjen did it, where did he get this stuff? Um, the only source we that pr- would have this stuff is probably the Children of the Forest. So one way or another, uh, it seems like the Children and therefore Bloodraven had one of these two people bury it for Ghost to find. But the fact that Ghost is acting so strange before he uncovers the, uh, the cash suggests to me that it was um cold hands that did it but i guess it could be either one um benjamin's missing so it's possible he's alive somewhere he's just not cold hands doesn't mean he's not um undead somewhere else though maybe there's multiple night's watch rangers running around under the command of blood raven um i would guess though that benjamin's dead that he's not coming back Especially because, like, yeah, like, again, where would Benjen get this stuff? Why would he even know what it is? Like, John's totally unaware what the Horn of Winter is, so is J.R. Mormont. How would Benjen have learned about this stuff, known where to find it, and then buried it, and then also alerted ghosts to where it was? Like, I don't, I don't really know. That, that whole situation makes less sense than just the last Green Seer doing it. Because, obviously, he would have the knowledge, if it was real he could see backwards in time he would know where john was he has control over animals so it kind of they all fit together in a nice way um if you successfully blow the horn do you do your lungs turn to ash like euron's minion is john able to evade that fact when he comes back to life that was something i'm talking about earlier um maybe that's the reason that Tormund did not blow it when stannis attacked or um vance didn't because it was right next to him when this like if he thought it was a double cross, surely Mance would have blown the horn. If he didn't, it could be because um, either he knew it would kill him or he knew it did nothing. Um, I'm guessing it was probably the that it knows that it doesn't do anything. But the fact that George has introduced this idea that if you blow a dragon binder three times and it kills you, it's very possible he replicates that behavior with the horn of winter. Yeah, well, I, I don't. Good call, Daisy. I don't know why Benjamin would be sneaky about it. Like, why not just come up to John and give it to him? Hey, it's me, Uncle Benjamin. And he'd be like, oh, Uncle Benjamin. And then he would give him the horn and say, Here, I found this. Use this stuff. This is really important. Why don't you come back with me, Benjamin? I've got other things I got to do. And then rides off. Like, that's a really good scene or a really easy scene to write. Like, if it's him, I don't know. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me. But would John be able to evade that fate if he comes back from the dead? Very possibly. That maybe the missing element for John is that he's not undead yet. Um, and he needs to blow it three times or something like that. Like there's there's something missing. 
that's the overwhelming thing about the horn of winter george is denying us information about what's happening with it and how to use it effectively um Uh, let me see if I got any other, any got, if you guys have any last questions, uh, throw them in the chat. My voice is starting to go. So, um, been talking for quite some time. So, oh, another one there. Just at me, bro. Throw them out there if I missed anything. Um, let me refresh this. <laughs> Oh, you guys, um, we hit 300, 200 likes. Uh, what can we do here? Oh, I know what I'll do. I'll, I'm going to post the link to, um, Chrissy reading, uh, from the upcoming video. So let me just set this to public and I'll drop it in chat. There we go. So this is, uh, thank you for slamming 200 likes. Uh, if you want to listen to a preview from the upcoming video, just follow that link and there's a 30 second clip. All right. So let's see here. Uh, Dornish Dame, do you think the wall comes down in late wins a winner or early a dream of spring? Late wins a winner. Um, he's set up essentially from what we know about the chapters have been released that early on in the book is going to hit a high point with the battles of ice and fire. And then it's going to go down to a lull as we go to the um, the down the consequences of those. And then I would guess that he he loves ending the books on a high point, like some big thing. So I would guess the wall coming down is how the winds of winter ends, and we go into a dream of spring, dealing with that. You guys should all be able to click that link. I think. Um, Brenda Starr says Sam will find out in Old Town what the horn is for or how to use it I suppose I mean if there's any place that has that knowledge that wasn't Castle Black then I guess it would be the Citadel but Eamon who supposedly read every book at the Castle Black when questions about the horn of winter essentially said like I don't even think it's real so I'm not sure what book would be at the Citadel that wouldn't be up at Castle Black that would know about it since it's such deep northern lore. Um, but, I mean, you make a place that has all the human knowledge of the world and experts on everything, then it's certainly possible that um, that somewhere in those books is something about the horn and how to use it. Like, I wonder if they'll do a thing like they did in the show. You're like, remember that where they had the picture of Arya's dagger and then didn't explain it? Maybe Sam would just be leafing through and be like, this is the horn. <laughs> um, I don't think Benjamin's going to show up with a flaming chain and spinning it around being like, John, I'm here to save you. I would be shocked. Um, who might be able to read the runes? I would guess that would be the Archmaster of, there's an Archmaster of History, I think. So maybe someone like that would be able to read the runes on it. Um, Matt, say something about cloaks of the Watchmen nobles and peasants. Uh, I think I talked about that already, but basically the cloak that is found is John notes that it's very fine wool and that it looks like it was well made. So it was probably that cloak probably came from somebody who was relatively high up in the Night's Watch or somebody that... Um, was well off to begin with like um like waymar he showed up to the night's watch with all like brand new gear and nice looking night's watch cloaks and all that kind of stuff so it's not people w rich people that join the night's watch generally arm themselves better than the peasants um <laughs> oh my god jimmy boy will george finish the books uh yes he's gonna finish wins a winner um, and I have a lot of hope for a dream of spring, although who knows when it will be. 
The thing about George's writing style that you have to keep in mind is that he tends to write in what is known. Well, I don't think it's known as this, but he essentially writes um, in streaks where when he starts, when he gets into a groove with something, he churns out thousands of words, tens of thousands of words, thousands of pages all at once. Like the first three books were written within like four years. And when he was writing the world of ice and fire, the same thing happened. If you go back and listen to um, Elio and Linda of Westerosh.org talk about it, they essentially, the world of ice and fire is supposed to be like a quarter of the size it is. But George prompted about this history, just kept writing about it. And he, he gave them something like 80,000 words when they wanted 20,000. So um, if he's on a roll at the winds of winter, then the, a dream of spring could be relatively quickly afterwards. Yeah, he binge writes. That's essentially, that's more or less how he does it. When he feels inspiration, he just fires off pages like you've never seen. He's very unlike, um, uh, people love comparing to Brandon Sanderson, but they're very different writers. Um, also Stephen King. There's a really good interview about Stephen King and um, George R. R. Martin, where King essentially contrasts his own style, where he says like, well, I don't write like that, George. I write a set amount every day and good or bad, I churn it out. So I would guess um, that informs the winds of winter and dream of spring more than like people love sort of like tracking on a graph how fast George writes, but that doesn't work. He doesn't work at a consistent rate. Uh, oh. One last uh, super chat here, or hopefully not one last, but we're probably going to be stopping soon. Uh, oh my God, Jimmy Boy, $10. Thank you so much. Uh, do you think George had gone along with the five year gap? Yes. I think he should have just gone with the five-year gap and moved the story ahead five years um his downsides to it was like how am i going to explain what happened to cersei and how was john on the night's watch for five years but then suddenly gets killed or something like that but i think he could write around those easier than um than what he did with splitting a feast for crows and a dance with dragons and i know there's interesting stories in between but like not <laughs> you know would the story have been served better by moving it forwards? Yeah, probably. It would have allowed him to especially move characters forward. Um, like Arya could be a real character um, in the broader story. She could come back from Bravos. Danny could have. Um, I'm not really sure what happened in Marine, but I, yeah, I think he should have gone through with it. But I am happy with what he produced otherwise. So. It's not really a big downside there. Uh, the Happy Masquerader, another five dollars. Thank you so much. Do you think the actual Long Night will take up will take up part of a Dream of Spring or be one decisive battle like in the show? I think the show was kind of ridiculous that it made the Long Night last like a week. Um, I think if he's going to do a Dream of Spring, there's going to be a lot more time skips than we're used to. Um, that he's going to jump around and we're going to deal with the actual idea of the others and how terrifying they are. Um, the show really didn't do that. They just kind of made the others invade and then they killed them real fast. Um, especially because George has put so much effort into telling us like how long the night long night was and the brutality of that long winter and what it did to the people. Like that's not going to be suffering. He's going to pass up. He loves suffering. Um, so I think that's about it. Um, let me check if Rhea Westeros is going today. They have a stream today. Uh, they might not. If they do, they're starting in a half hour. Um, anybody know if Lady Gwyn and uh, Yoke Boy are streaming today? doesn't look like it and it looks like they might be taking the week off um 
they put out a wins a winner primer the other day so yeah, i don't think so i think uh, i don't think they're streaming today that's a bummer i was gonna hope that i was gonna try and watch that afterwards to decompress from streaming um so that will be about it for today we got how many people did we get we got a lot of people uh max viewers uh 210 215 likes that is amazing um thank you for everybody that sent in super chats and uh paypal donations if you want to support me and you enjoyed this stream then you can go to patreon.com slash joe magician um if you want to sign up to get access to the patron slack and uh content that comes early the five dollar up and level is the one that you want to you want to go for um that gets you access to most of the stuff um there are higher ones if you feel if inclined uh description all the stuff is on there if you want to check it out um thank you to all my many patrons um the mods the wonderful wonderful mods that kept track of the chat today you guys are the best couldn't do it without you no Nightbot today. I did not turn on Nightbot because it went crazy and killed Amy Blackfire last time. Um, not sure what the topic will be for next week, but um, I'll let you guys know. Same time, Saturday at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And yep, hit that like button, subscribe, hit that bell button so you get notified next time. And look for this week, the Lady Stoneheart video coming out. The audio is all finished. I just have to do the... Um, the video part which um i could not get done last week because things came up unfortunately things i could not ignore